Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and to invite me to this stage. It is my very first time being in Romania, and I am already blown away by the beauty of your country. I actually took the trip or the effort to take the train from Bucharest to Cluj, and everybody is looking at me very weirdly because apparently that's not a thing you are supposed to do. But it was very beautiful, actually. The forest is great and every leaf is turning red and orange and it was a beautiful sight, so I highly recommend it. But you're probably not here to hear about my travel stories, are you? You are here to get inspired, to network, to learn about new techniques and maybe learn a new language feature. And that is where I come in. Today we are going to talk about how your brain is wired and how you are learning new languages or new programming languages for that matter. And I can imagine that you're wondering, but <laughs> who are you to tell us about this? Well, I'm Simone de Geit and I come from the Netherlands where I graduated in 2015 as a speech and language therapist. So I have quite a different background than most of you will have. But directly after I switched to IT, I did a traineeship and I currently work for Open Value Amsterdam, uh, where I work as a Java and Kotlin developer consultant. Now, today we are going to look on how your brain is working. And with every section of the talk, I'm going to give you some practical tools on how you can use that knowledge in your day-to-day -day IT practice. So hopefully, with all those tools, you can get the most out of today. And let's get started. Before we really dive into how we are learning, we need to know where we save that knowledge, right? So we are going to start with how your memory is being stored. Now, I highly recommend you, you all got, I think, a goodie bag. And I think inside the goodie bag, you will find a notepad and a pen. If you want, this is the time to take it out. I will get to it why this can be very beneficial in the process of learning. Uh, but you can also take out your phone, of course, whatever you like. All right, without further ado, let's go to Dory, our cute little blow fish from the Disney movie Nemo. We probably all have seen her before, and although she's very cute, she has one tiny problem. She forgets everything. Everything that's being said to her or that she experienced before, she immediately forgets it. So it kind of feels like the only thing that she can rely on is her short-term memory. And short-term memory can be compared in that sense to a RAM disk of a computer. It is a temporary storage where you can save a limited amount of data. And this is very true for the short-term memory because we can only save two up to six chunks of information at a time. In 1950-something, they thought it was five up to nine, so you might have heard that before, but more recent research actually shows that it's even less. So that's not a lot, and every chunk of information has a time to live for about 30 seconds. So what is a chunk? A chunk can be anything. A chunk can be a word. A chunk can be an entire concept. But a chunk can also be a letter when that is the only thing that you can cluster it by. So lo let's look at this example, this line of code. We have a variable name, which is very random. It's even probably hard to pronounce because the letters are placed in an order which doesn't make sense. It's something that you will not stumble across, most likely. So because of that, you can already see that the letters are divided into separate chunks because we cannot cluster them together. The only thing that we can cluster is the O and the A because probably our brain will immediately treat that as the sound O and take that together. Now, a funny thing is that when we look at string, it hasn't been spread out, right? It is not S-T-R-E-N-G, because when we read it immediately, your brain is taking it up as one word because we all know that word. And that is why if we take, for example, this line of code, 
even though the line of code is actually longer, has more characters, it takes up less space inside our short-term memory. And that is, first tip of the day, why we should try to pr uh, prevent using abbreviations. Because abbreviations, most of the time, take up a lot of space into, uh, inside your short-term memory. Now, the second thing that we can learn is that when you're trying to learn a new language, try to look at the design patterns and start to use them. Because in this specific uh, example, if we are using the design pattern, okay, every time I create a variable name for, the for a Boolean type, I start with the verb is, then we could even remove the second chunk because Boolean is always connected to the variable is as a variable name starter, as a prefix. So we can already clean that up a little bit. Now, okay, there's only so much we can do when it comes to reducing the amount of chunks that we are using, right? We still kind of need something else, right? Yeah, 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 those are the tips. Get them, write them down, no. <laughs> All right, so we need something else. We also need, and you will not be surprised, a long-term memory. We need something that's a little bit bigger. So I have another Disney analogy for you. The elephants of Jungle Book. They swear that they will forget never anything nada. And in that sense, a hard disk, or a <laughs> I already told it, a long-term memory can be compared to a hard disk. It is a place where you permanently store data, indefinitely, unless it crashes, but let's not go there. So indefinitely data storage and for a lot of data, right? So that is great, but if I tell you this, you might wonder, <laughs> okay, that's all very nice, but I definitely forget something sometimes. I definitely have sometimes that I'm like, I learned this before, but I have no clue what it is now. So is this actually true? Well, best to compare it to a forest. Let's say, oh, it's a different slide, cool. Okay, let's go, <laughs> let's do this slide first. Okay, whenever we are seeing new objects, um, the first time we see it, there is no encoding whatsoever about the subject. There will be no long-term memory, so you will have no idea what this creature is. Now, the second time, you will have encoded it, so probably you know now, right? It's inside your long-term memory. But probably not. It hasn't been consolidated. You haven't went over it enough of times. So, you need to see it again. Again, you are encoding it. And then the third time you see it, or some other iteration, then at some point you will get consolidated and you can actually retrieve the long-term memory. And this is so cool because research shows that we don't forget things. The long-term memory is there. It's only the pathway leading to the memory that causes the issues. So now, we go to the slide where I wanted to go with the forest. Nice. All right, the forest. You are standing in front of a forest. It is untouched. No human has ever been there. I can imagine in Romania that's actually a very good example because you will find some places where the forest is quite untouched. Now, you are standing in front of it and you want to walk through it. So the very first time you need to like get the branches out of the way, you make yourself a pathway. But when you revisit it the very next day, it's gone. You cannot find the path anymore because it has already been overgrown. Only when you revisit that same path again and again, time after time, at some point it will get consolidated and it will be a paved path. Where you can actually, which you can actually see and retrieve. So that's a very cool thing, and actually, I'm so happy to tell you that you have a lot of knowledge, and we are here to learn on how to create those pathways. So, in order to know how pathways work, we need to know in what kind of structure the pathways 
are being built. And it's not a hierarchical structure, it's more a network structure. In this example, the white lines can be considered as the pathways. So the more pathways lead to a specific term, the easier it is for you to retrieve the knowledge. So let's take this as a blueprint. The person knows all these words, and he wants now to learn a new word, tiger. Will it be easy for him to learn tiger? Yeah, probably. He knows a lot of other concepts that belong to the tiger. He has a lot of pathways. So the chances are pretty high that the next time he needs to tell somebody about a tiger, he can reach that information and that concept that he learned because he already got it more consolidated. He has got more hooks to get to that knowledge. If he wants to learn, for example, the word pigeon, like the bird, that will be a whole lot harder. He doesn't know about birds. Flying animals, you say? Never heard of that. Like, I know a penguin is kind of a bird, but doesn't fly. So that would be a lot harder. And you might notice that I put the colors in coloring. I didn't only do that for fun. I did that because the network structure you see here is not only consisting of words. It's actually a network of all your senses. So. The colors you see there, probably when you think of a tiger, you don't think of the words black and orange. You probably visualize the colors orange and black. You know the colors by the side of it. So whenever you want to learn, for example, a dolphin, it makes a lot of sense to add a picture of a dolphin or go to the zoo and view a dolphin because every sense will get its own hook, will create an own pathway which will make it more consolidated. So, as you can see, it will create new pathways. And that is what we call in linguistics... Oh yeah, great, another tip. That is what we call in linguistic contextual association. It is the correlation that you, uh, that you create between sensory perspectives. And most of the time, that goes quite automatic, because you are currently learning, and you are already making use of that contextual association, because you are using your sight to view the slides, and, you are hearing, uh, and you're using your hearing to hear whatever I'm saying. So you're already making it into practice. Now let's see how we can use this in our IT environment. Let's say we want to learn about records. They got introduced in Java 14, and you want to know everything about it. You hear about it, like you, you need to know the deal. So first thing, you're in luck. Records is pretty easy, like besides from what it does, it's pretty easy to remember, right? It's a word that we already know. It's something that we can already have already a pathway to, and it's easy to pronounce. It's a lot easier than, let's say, for example, Sun Peaky CS11, which will take up a lot more slides inside your short-term memory to even process it. Records can just be one chunk. It's nice, right? So again, we already went over it. Try also to write in your code because you will like there will be people reading your code who are learning the language. And when you tr try to make this a regular practice, you will help them learn during the process of reading classes. So we are already in luck. It was a very easy word to hear phonetically and to place some hooks on. So now we can move on. We can look at the meaning and the grammatical rules of whatever a record does. Now, when we talk about contextual association, you are probably reading through some kind of informational block or anything, right? So you're using your sense sight. But I would recommend to also start using your hearing Start reading it, uh, it out loud. And I'm not joking about this. It will greatly ha benefit uh, you when you start reading whatever you want to learn out loud. It will also help when you start writing it over. Even though that might sound dumb, you might all have written summaries during high school, right? 
And we didn't only do that in order to make our learning process easier. We also did it because it stuck more easily with us. Now, those were examples of contextual association that are being created quite automatically. Whenever we start reading out loud or we start writing it over, you will already have that contextual association. But like with the example with the dolphin that we want to have a picture, that's quite hard when we look at IT, right? Most concepts in IT doesn't have a clear visualization. But we can create that, and that is where creative contextual association comes in. It's an intentional correlation that you create, and it works just as good as if a picture of a dolphin would connect to a dolphin, the word. So what it means is that you can create a symbol or a visualization that works for you in order to tie it up, to link it to the concept that you are learning. Now, you might think, ha, but with records, I don't need to do that. I already have a visualization. Got it. <laughs> well, you can have that visualization, but it, can, it will probably do more harm than it would do good. Because whenever you see this visualization, it is like an amplifier to take the path to the meaning of that visualization, which is a musical record, and it's not a class with immutable data. So better to split it up into separate concepts and create your own visualization. You can do whatever you want. You are all developers, so I assume every one of you is very creative. Uh, I took here a file with bars because I thought of a class file. Uh, with data that is captured and that cannot be changed. So there you go. And you can do whatever you like. You don't even have to tell your colleagues that you're doing this if you don't find it cool or anything. But to be honest, I think it's pretty cool if you take like ownership of your own learning curve, so own it. You can definitely get away with it, I would say. Now let's move on to learning from kids. And why do I want to talk about that? Because kids learn without thinking about it, right? Whatever they do, it's naturally. They don't have learned any learning techniques. They just do. And that is why I love to look at them to see how we can incorporate the way they learn to our day-to-day -day practice. Well, I don't know. Can I see some hands? Who has children? OK, OK, half almost. You might all remember that phase where your kid starts repeating everything they hear around them, which is amazing most of the time, until they go into the swear words and the curses. Not that nice. That is what we call parroting. And we also do it almost daily. We parrot by looking at our big buddy Stack Overflow, and we are parroting them. Now, I do need to make a remark. It is not parroting when you are copy-pasting. Copy-pasting is a passive way of learning. I am assuming here that you actually read the Stack Overflow blog before copy-pasting it, but still you are just taking the information and dropping it out there. Whereas parroting is an active way of learning. It is you got something, you heard something, and you are using it in your own practice. So if you want to use that in an IT environment, instead of copy-pasting it, put your Stack Overflow on the left side, put your code editor on the right side, and type it out. Just start typing it over, because you are then again making use of that contextual association, and you are actively interpreting whatever is being said over there. Now, secondly, it is a lot of fun, the internet. I am very happy that we have it, uh, but a lot of information sticks around for a very long time. So if you go to a Stack Overflow post from five years ago with 100 likes, you are like, damn, that, that is a good solution. 100 likes, man, that must be a great solution, but it can very well be outdated. And if you take that as the truth, it can be that you are consolidating your pathway and that at one point that becomes paved 
and it's very hard to unlearn. So I would highly recommend also from your own learning curve, because it makes sense to look at different situations, to read at least three solutions. Look at different implementations, see if it's outdated, how other people use it, and then see what works for you. And that actually brings us to the second thing that children do. They try it out. They try it out. They keep saying, like, they, if they learned the word couch, for example, they will try it out and we say, hey, couch. But it's a chair, right? It's not a couch. But they would just try it out because they need to feel it. They need to try it out in different situations to get their network structure that we just talked about more deepened, more structurized, more pathways. And that is all great. But it only works if someone corrects you, right? Again, when you keep saying couch to a chair and everybody's like, good for you, that's fine, just keep calling it couch, then at some point it will be very hard to unlearn that that's actually a chair. So find yourself a mentor or someone that can correct you. We are all learning all the time. If you, you, and you probably know that because you're here on a Fox days. I don't need to tell you that we keep on learning. So last but not least, for at least this part, is start easy. Kids are not starting with the word refrigerator. I even find it hard to pronounce. But they start with the easy words, right? The words that they hear the most. And that makes a lot of sense when we look back at our short-term memory, because we only had the six chunks. And they don't have a lot of knowledge in their long-term memory because they're just starting the world to get to know the world. So they need to depend a lot on the short-term memory. Now, I feel I forget something. We talked about memory storage, about short-term, long-term. But how does it actually end up there? Well, we have a working memory. And researchers are a little bit disagreeing on the fact if that is actually a separate entity or if it's part of the short-term memory. It's very indecisive. Some researchers say it's separate, some say it isn't. For this core or for this talk, I would like to treat it as a separate thing because I like the fact that it's split it up in storage and something like a process engine. It makes it more clear for me. Now, where the, conflict, uh, the confusion comes up is that because the working memory also only can hold two up to six chunks at a time. So you see the, the comparisons, right? Now, I think we all have had that moment where we were reading a class and we were right, like at that point where we were like, I just can't get my head around it. It's just too much. And it's not even maybe that difficult, but it, I just, I need to write it down, or I need to find myself a rubber duck, or I need something to deal with my cognitive load. And cognitive load is the amount of chunks that you are using up in your, short, uh, in your working memory. And whenever the six chunks are being in use, and you want to d use more, then you get cognitive overload. And you need to deal with that. Now. I have a tip for you. Automate the retrieval of your uh, long-term memory. Because we talked about a forest and that you can consolidate that into a paved pathway, but what I didn't tell you is that we can actually make a highway out of it. That's cool, huh? Nice. And the cool thing about a highway is that that information that you're retrieving from there is information that you don't even have to think about it. It's information that just pops up because you went over it so many times. It doesn't, need a it doesn't need to take up a chunk or a slot inside your working memory. Now, this is already, I think, a great reason to start learning and start automating the knowledge that you have. But I can still see some faces in this room looking like, yeah, but sorry, but I've got Google. I don't need to automate this learning. I can just open my Google browser and search for it, right? I hear it nowadays. I hear it quite often on conferences, like, oh, yeah, but you don't need to know it. Like, you can Google it. It's true. Definitely, you can Google it. But 
apart from the fact that when you Google it, you actually need to take that information because you didn't automate it yet, right? So you need to take that information, put it in a chunk in your working memory, and then use it in whatever you were coding. So you can save yourself a slot using that for other information that you need to process. But next to that, Felina Hermans talks in her book, The Programmer's Brain, which is a great recommendation if you like this talk and this co and like everything what this talk is about. It's a great book. She is saying that at least 20% of a developer's time is spent on interruptions. <laughs> That's a day if you work 40 hours a week. That's a long time, right? And that, that percentage is actually increasing the last couple of years because of the use of Google and Stack Overflow. Because when we're in a coding flow and we need to get out of it and start Googling it, the chances are also pretty high that you're seeing other notifications. And at the moment that you are out of your flow, it takes at least up to 50 minutes to get back into the flow. So, I hope I all convince you now that we want to build ourselves a lot of highways, right? To become an efficient and better programmer. Now, I have some tips on how to learn, how to automate that retrieval. And the very first thing I would recommend to you is think before you search. Think of it as that highway. You have two options. Either you stand before the, uh, for the road, it's not a highway yet, before the path in the forest, and you're like, I can't quite see it. I think I turn away and I'm going to Google for it. Or you can at least try. You can try to get over that pathway, and maybe you take a misstep. Maybe you don't reach the end, but at least you went over it again. You actively try to recall and try to clear the pathway that you already have. And now whenever you are in doubt, I do highly recommend to, after you try to think of it, to Google it. Because again, you don't want to have a wrong concept, right? You don't want to learn yourself a wrong concept and then later needing to unlearn it again. But first thing, try it out. If you are thinking of a syntax that you don't know, try to write down the syntax as much as you know, and then Google for it. Now, the second tip is flashcards. Um, it can be compared, or at least like why I'm saying this, can be compared to learning language application Duolingo. I, I don't know how common it is in Romania. I see some people nodding. Okay, awesome. And uh, the fun thing about Duolingo is that the lessons aren't specifically long. They are pretty short. You can do a lesson in five minutes. The whole thing is that it's about repetition and going over it most likely every day. And that is so well thought of because rather than spending a day or a week on a course and then not use it for a month, rather take it slow and steady and learn something every day. Because if you are spending your money or your company's money on a course, let's say you're wanting to learn Kotlin, but you're not going to try it out in practice after that course, the memory will be there, like what I said, like you will not, like the memory will be in a long-term memory, but the pathway will be completely overgrown. You need to revisit it again and again if you want to make it a highway. Now, flashcards, the concept of a flashcard is that on one side you write whatever you want to remember, what you want to learn, and on the other side you write something to remember it by, a visualization or a term or anything. So, for example, I have here Hello Fox, and I remembered that if I pronounce it right, it should be Buena Zia Vox in Romania. Is that right? Can somebody not? Yeah, okay, oh, pretty much. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> pretty much. You're getting close. Okay, cool. So some, you can, of course, create the flashcards by hand, which is 
amazing for your contextual association because you are excellently using another sense to create those which will help your learning. But I can imagine it's not that convenient. To be honest, I use an application as well. I use Anki. Anki is great. Like you can just type in the front, you can type in the back. And Anki will just like do a link or send you out a, remember, uh, a reminder every day to go over at least 10 of your flashcards. And after each flashcard, you say if you could retrieve it by ease, if you filled, or anything in between. And depending on that, it will show it more often in the next couple of sessions. Now, another way of learning would be to create a dictionary. So every time you Google for something, every time you don't know something, which you like you want to know, you can write it down. And this is, again, a way of active learning, right? It's about monomics, different scenarios. Uh, you can write pr the pros and cons. You can make the visualization. We already went over it. It's a little bit more of repetition, but we just heard repetition is good, right? OK, I need, to, I need to check. Sorry how long I'm already speaking. OK, yeah, we're going OK. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the last thing I want to go over is study time. Personally, I really like study time. I do it every Friday on 8.30 for half an hour. And the, the thing is that it works best if you pick a day, every day the same day, every day, every week the same time, and preferably at the beginning of the day when you're still fresh. And here's where you combine different techniques. Again, you are going to try to work with those dictionaries. You are going to try to search for it, write down whatever you find valuable. You're going to think about how you can use it in different situations. And during that 30 minutes, you don't need to actually use it. You are only going to create the pathways, to create the hooks. Where you are going to use it is in the week after. And what I would recommend is that every start of the day, when you have your planned work before you, you are going to think actively on how can I use this information in my day-to-day -day practice? How can I use this, this concept today? And there will definitely be days where you cannot use it, right? There will be days that you are learning about records and you are just not going to work with data classes. So, yeah, no, no use of actually um, practicing it out that day. And, but that doesn't matter. The whole thing is that you are thinking about the scenarios where you can use it. And because you are actively thinking about, can I use a record in this scenario, even though the answer might be no, you still consolidated it more because you have th given it thought and you have given yourself a reason and more explanation on where it works and where it doesn't work. Now, after a week, you're going to evaluate. You are going to look back. It's, it's like the recall, the think before you search slide, right? Because you are going to recall whenever you used it the last week. And I recommend not writing it down during the week, but really try to recall it. Because that will, again, take you over that road. And then change your whatever you wrote down in your dictionary before, change it accordingly. Maybe there were some situations where you haven't thought of before. Maybe you actually interpret something wrong. And then last but not least, fun part, explain it to others. Not only will it give you the satisfaction of the fact that you can be, that you can be sure that you've learned something, it's also like a little bit of a test, right? Like, am I able to, to explain this to somebody else? And if you are, then that would give you great satisfaction. But secondly, you are learning together. You are actually learning as a community. And that is why I love conferences like these as well so much because we are a community, right? We are doing this together and we can inspire each other. And by these kinds of exercises, we can trigger each other and maybe they have thought of situations where you didn't even think of. So 
That is the last part of my presentation, learning together. Now, there is one small remark about learning together, especially when you're already a couple of years in the field. It's called the curse of expertise. And the curse of expertise means that you kind of forgot how you got at the level you are at now. The fact that you were a junior once, and the fact that you had cognitive overload all the time, is something that you blocked out of your memory. And you can become quite impatient for your juniors. Like, oh, don't you get it? I just told you that. But maybe when you told him that, he was already out of his ch six chunks, and the information that you offered was the seven chunk, meaning it didn't end up in the long-term memory. So be patient with each other. Be humble and try to remember that you once were in their shoes. And besides from that, talk about the new concepts. We already went over it a little bit with uh, study time, but by talking about new concepts, you are also validating your own perceptions, right? Am I actually right? with this assumption. Maybe can, someone can correct you or can add something to it. Now, when you are in the process of learning together, you will come across a point where you need to give feedback, right? As a speech and language therapist, I learned that children don't like it when you tell them they are wrong. Yeah, they, they, they get also like, besides from the fact that they don't like it, they also get insecure about it. It's not nice to, to hear that, that you don't know stuff, right? And of course we are all grown ups, like we can handle the negativity a bit better than most children can. Still, it can become quite a lot when you're new and you keep on hearing that you're doing stuff wrong. So what we learned is that when a kid says, hey, that's a towel, then we say, oh, do you want to have the cat? Instead of saying, no, that's, that's not a towel. No, that's a cat. You see that, right? It's a cat. We just repeat it, but then with the right term. And that is what we call indirect feedback. And you can also practice this when you're working with your colleagues and you want to, especially when they're a junior. So whenever you have, for example, the junior gives you a merge request and you see 10 things that are up with it, you're like, oh man, where do I start? Instead of pointing all 10 out, pick one or two that are the most urgent. You can give direct feedback on that of course, but keep in mind that they have a cognitive load and they are in, in the process of learning. So maybe the other eight, skip them for now and use your indirect feedback on it. So maybe in the next day, you are having yourself a merge request where you actually have an example of the right implementation. And you're asking your junior, hey, can you maybe review my merge request? And then he's able to see the way in you actually created a change. And maybe afterwards, you can even talk about it. You're like, hey, did you actually notice that I, I, I created this way? I saw that you did it the other way. Why, uh, why, why, why did you come to that solution? Not directly saying it's wrong, but just asking. <laughs> why, did, <laughs> why did you come to that solution? And of course, just as I said, we, of course, need to give direct feedback from time to time. Because sometimes it's just something that cannot move to the develop branch or the main branch or the master branch, whatever you're using. And you need to give direct feedback. And that's fine. Like, you, you can do that. Just keep in mind to keep it a little bit, like, separate. Don't do everything at once. Um, and a, you might have seen the feature on GitLab suggested change. Who of you uses suggested changes? Okay, okay, yeah, a few, not, not that much. Um, I would recommend not using it. <laughs> Don't use it. Because of the fact that when you are suggesting a change, 
you are taking away the possibility of that other person to actively learn. They can maybe passively learn, they can see your change and they can be like, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense, and then approve. But by giving them the opportunity to actually take that information and writing it out themselves, it will be more consolidated. They are using multiple senses, they are trying it out themselves in different situations. There you go. Repetition, 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 this talk, right? Nice. All right, so we are at the end. I hope that the cognitive load, that nobody is like cognitive overloaded at this point. Um, some tips or the key takeaways of today. Um, first of all, use your senses. Use multiple senses whenever you are learning. So if you go out today and you go to the other sessions, maybe write it down. You could try it. You can also speak out loud, but I'm not sure if the other presenters will like that, if <laughs> you're reading out the slides out loud. So maybe stick to writing it down. Um, actively apply whatever you are learning. Find someone that can correct you, because we are all learning together, and you don't want to unlearn something that is already very paved, or even a highway, later on. And automate your long-term memory retrieval, because that will save you so much frustration, and it will become so, you will become so much more efficient in your day-to-day -day practice. And how you can do that, you saw that on the slides. If you don't remember, that doesn't matter, because um, I will get the slide deck for you out in a second. Um, you can, uh, what I said, use your notebook for today. You can maybe even install Anki right now and create your flashcards on the go. And if you don't like it, you delete the app by tomorrow. But you can try it out, right? It's fun. Now, some sources that I've used for this presentation, most of the things are coming from my own study times, uh, but up top is the book The Programmer's Brain from Feline. It's very useful. And with that being said, I want to thank you so much, and I hope you have a very pleasant day and that you enjoy and learn a lot.